Hello, it is the day of Thor. Uh, there is economic news out there in the world, and it is here. Starting with the burning platform, mainstream media says car sales soar. He's stolen the chart from Calculated Risk, an uh, excellent chart going back to 1967 for SAAR on US light vehicle sales, autos and trucks. 67 with all the re recessions in, basically where it is now at about 12 and just over 12 and a half million or just under 12 and a half million. Take that line across and it's about the average line going back till 1967. It is coming up after the recession because it was down into single figures so 12 and a half is better than nine and a half but the thing that Jim's picked up on in this is this I'll put it up on the screen in this case 1973 with a 212 million population 15.8 million cars were sold and that makes 74 cars per 1,000 people 1978 223 million population 16 million car sales 72 cars per thousand 1987 242 million population 18 million cars sold 74 per thousand now 2011 310 million population only 12.3 million cars sold making 40 cars per thousand compared to the 1987 78 73 of 74 72 74 cars per thousand it's not down half but it is shockingly bad basically you can say in the 70s and 80s America was on the up and up but what the hell is happening now and does it bode well for the future kiddies no of course it doesn't that's good for the mainstream media that the number has come up close to 12 and a half million but it's nowhere near good paper economy gives us um, it's a chart about the commercial paper market uh, and tells us that the commercial paper market is essentially a private debt market used by corporations as a generally cheaper me means of funding typical recurring operations than drawing on a line of credit at the bank. And has the chart wiggly wiggly all the way up to just before the uh, credit crunch, because this is purely financial, at over two trillion dollars in the CP market. And it's come all the way down through the recession and is continuing to go down and down and down and now is below a trillion. It's a huge broken cog in the uh, financial apparatus. Bloomberg gives us US Congress blunts agency fund request to enforce Dodd-Frank. That's the uh, Dodd-Frank Act that's meant to sort out a few financial, financial um, <coughs> problems. Federal lawmakers agreed yesterday to fund the government at current levels. Um, basically, to do the extra work, they're civil servants, they need lots and lots and lots of extra money. And they probably do need an awful lot more money because they need a lot more people at the um, SEC and the CFTC. But the gits in Washington are not giving them the money. So you can have your bill, but we won't pay anybody to enforce it. Very, very far from brilliant. Australia. Flood is concern for coal prices, a commodities lesson. Floods not seen in the modern era have shuttered coal mines throughout an area of Queensland, Australia, the size of Texas. Several large international miners, including Rio Tinto, will take huge losses. That is only part of the trouble. The interruption may go on for months, which will almost certainly make the price of coal rise. There is significant coal shortages in China. There is no immediate relief for the problem. China is a major consumer of coal, just as it is of crude oil. Demand from the world's second largest economy by GDP, that's China, will push up prices. The cost of coal to industry in China is underwritten by the central government. That means China will either have to take larger losses or pass the prices on to the private sector. The government will take those losses. The coal mine problems in Australia could have an immediate effect on steel prices. The island nation, Australia, produces about half the world's coking cola for the steel industry. And that's what's actually written as a typo in the article. Um, Australia produces half the world's coking cola for the steel industry. Coking coal, it obviously should be, or just coke. Um, if the world could run on Coca-Cola, Perhaps uh, everything would turn out all right, but it can't, so it won't. Seattle Times Bellevue Tower developer turns project over to the lenders. 
The developer of Bellevue Towers, the region's biggest condo project ever, has turned over the development to the lenders to avoid foreclosure. Seattle, biggest condo, blocks, two big blocks, turned over jingle mail to Morgan Stanley, I think, in this on this occasion. FT Alphaville um, are back from holiday. <gasps> Super. Issuance isn't the Eurozone's big problem. Issuance of government debt, that is. Uh, projected for 2011 is going to be lighter issuance, less government debt issuance in 2011 than there was for 2010 in the Eurozone. But the problem isn't the issuance, it says here, it's the asset. As in, it's not the quantity, it's the actual quality that is the real problem. And this can be seen from the next link, which is to The Economist, which gives us the 10 uh, most boundingly brilliant uh, increasing GDP countries in the world and the 10 worst. I'll give you the best ones, why not? Um, which are obviously po positive big numbers around double figures, about 10%. Qatar, in the Middle East there. Ghana, Mongolia, Eritrea, Ethiopia, China. India, Uzbekistan, Timor-Leste, and Laos. So besides India and China, which are big hitters, it must be said, the rest are minnows and really aren't going to affect the world economy that much, are they? But in the worst 10, and the top four of them are still positive, just, just this side of positive, are Spain, Bahamas, Iceland and Italy. You know, just barely positive. And these uh, last six are negative. Venezuela, Ireland, Barbados, Portugal, Greece and Puerto Rico. Going back to the issuance of government debt and the quality, not the quantity, and the problems in the Eurozone, in those worst ten in the world we have Spain, Italy, Ireland, Portugal and Greece. All in the worst ten. And between the top ten and the bottom ten is the rest of the world, so the bottom is very low. Bloomberg gives us biggest financial decision in 2011 is European. In other words, all uh, financial decisions to be made, the big decision is a European decision. And this article by Matthew Lynn says, what's the biggest financial decision facing Europe in 2011? That's easy, the cho choice of a new president for the ECB, the European Central Bank. When Jean-Claude Trichet steps down from the post in October, the leading candidates to succeed him will be the Bundesbank president, Axel Weber, and the governor of the Bank of In Italy, Mario Draghi. Now, Draghi is a top guy. Very good. But he's Italian. Are the Germans going to want an Italian in charge of the ECB? <gasps> no. Axel Weber, are the peripheral zone countries going to want a German in charge of the ECB? No. Because the only way out is for the ECB to print up money and buy their bonds. Uh, Matthew Lynn is right. It will be a big call. Let's finish, up, finish with want in the China Times. Want China Times. China expands its easing of capital controls on exporters. Now, I feel that this is a huge story and it would take weeks of analysis. But we don't have weeks, do we? So, I'll give you the first couple of paragraphs. In order to reduce inflation pressures, which we know are you know, coming on in China, China eased capital controls on exporters' foreign currency earnings starting January 1st in a move that over time could slow growth in the massive foreign exchange res reserves that have made Beijing a heavyweight global investor. I'll come back to that. The move was announced on Friday in an expansion of a program allowing exporters to keep their foreign currency earnings overseas instead of changing them into yuan. Although China's political leadership controls the exchange rate and the impact of such market forces is limited, it is believed that the re by reducing demand for the yuan from exporters, it could eventually ease pressure on the Chinese currency to appreciate. So they're taking a bit of a view that... I'll, I'll tell you what kind of is happening here, although it's terribly difficult. China sells things, say in dollars, those the people that um, are paid in dollars have to or let's say had to by law take that money to the bank let's just cut out that take it to the central bank and get yuan for it dollars come in dollars go to the central bank that the central bank give the yuan and then central bank of china has got these huge quantities of dollars to buy treasuries with that's the old system but you can see when the dollars go in to buy the treasuries yuan come out and that's creating inflation in china 
they're saying now if not so many dollars get converted into yuan there won't be so much demand for yuan so the actual value of yuan could actually drop now that's what's implied there which is one thing another thing is obviously uh, the uh, business owners in china now have these dollars that they now are allowed to do with what they want they don't have to take them to the Chinese central bank. They can go out and build a, a new factory in Singapore or Bolton or anywhere. And they, or they could buy commodities. They could buy steel and stock them in the Philippines. They can do with it what they want. That means there won't be so many yuan in China. But the, the Chinese central bank won't be there buying treasuries either. And a lot of implications come out of this one headline, China expands its easing of capital controls on exporters. Oh, it's so difficult. Bye.